Hello. So one of the things that we're talking about this week is American Gothic literature. American Gothic has sometimes been called the dark side of individualism, and one of the reasons for that is because Gothicism in general went against the idea of Romanticism. This was a different school of thought, a different literary era. The Romantics um, were very concerned with um, nature and with kind of man's place in the world and everything. They celebrated the beauties of nature in their writing, um, and they, they did this because they were reacting against the age of reason, so to speak. So in literary criticism, we have all of these different ages, some of which correspond pretty obviously to what's actually going on in history in real life, some of them don't. It, it just reflects kind of the themes and the methods that were present in the writing of the time. But yeah, so the Romantics were originally writing from a place of wanting to kind of free the imagination, to break away from the age of reason and just sheer logical thinking and whatnot, and to create sort of an ideal situation in their writing that involved a lot of communing with nature, a lot of reflecting on man's place in the universe, and then the Gothics came along and they looked at this and they said that not only do we have good things regarding nature and man's place in the universe, we also have some darkness, right? There is darkness, there is light in the world, this is fact, and they wanted to explore the darkness a little bit more in order to better understand it. Another aspect of the origin of Gothicism in literature comes literally from Gothic architecture. So in Gothic architecture, um, you have cathedrals, you have buildings that are created with this idea of trying to inspire awe or terror in the people who are either entering or just beholding the building. Um, so they usually had great, you know, spires with pointy bits coming off of them. Um, you know, if you look at Notre Dame, if you look at um, any kind of old ancient cathedral, a lot of times you'll see some Gothic architecture in there. And that was because um, the, the people who designed the cathedrals wanted them to come in and be not necessarily terrified, because you don't necessarily want to go to church and be terrified, but you want to be awe-inspired. And so they made these buildings that were impressive, that were, um, you know, a little bit dark, um, so that people could be in the proper mindset um, that they wanted them to be in. They also included elements in their architecture such as gargoyles, um, and a gargoyle, even though obviously it is a monster, it's meant to look scary and whatever, they were not there to terrify people. They were there to keep evil spirits or demons away. That was the purpose of a gargoyle. Um, the idea was that, oh, the demon will come and it'll see this terrifying monster on the outside of the building and it won't go inside the building. So Gothic literature actually started in, well, Europe technically, um, but when it reached America, it pretty much started with Poe and Nathaniel Hawthorne. These were sort of the main people who came to be known for American Gothicism. So in the 19th century, Edgar Allan Poe is using elements of Gothic writing all over the place, um, and he's much more widely recognized in Europe, in France and England to be specific, because again, that is kind of, you know, the area in which Gothic literature sort of took off. Um, you have in England, the Penny Dreadfuls, um, if you've ever heard of that, uh, little serial stories in their papers about murders and things like that. That's where Sweeney Todd came from. Um, not the musical version, but the, the Penny Dreadful version, which was a short story in a series, and then it became a novel. And anyway, we're not here to talk about Sweeney Todd, but good book, you should read it sometime. So Poe is writing using these Gothic elements, and when he's doing that, he's attempting to delve into kind of what makes the human soul or the human mind tick. So again, for Gothic writers, it wasn't enough for them to just write about the fact that, you know, we as humans have a place in the larger sphere of the world. We exist as part of nature and with nature. It wasn't enough for them to say that. That was for the Romantics to say they believe that, but they also wanted to say, well, as part of human nature, we have some darkness. We put into the world some negative things and we should acknowledge that and explore it and hopefully come to understand it a little bit better. So Poe's settings in his stories are dark, usually not literally dark sometimes, but meaning, you know, it takes place in either a ancient castle or a decaying estate or just somewhere creepy in general. Um, his characters, usually if they're men, they're crazy. If they're females, they're sometimes also crazy, but they're usually also sick and dying, um, which is, you know, maybe a little bit sexist, but also kind of realistic to Poe's life. He 
personally um, went through his his family dying, his mother, his father, and then his uh, wife also grew really sick and died. So it's no surprise really that most of the women in his stories are dying. And it's also probably no surprise that most of the men are crazy because, you know, so was he a little bit. Many of Poe's plots include so-called gothic elements such as murder, such as live burial, which is one of his biggest fears, which is why it features prominently in many of his stories. And then also this idea that the things that you do in life can come back to haunt you um, at any point in time. Poe believed that in extreme situations, in instances of terror or stress, um, just high emotional states, people reveal their true nature. And you see this a lot in modern day horror as well. If you think about things that like Stephen King or Joe Hill or anybody like that have written, you're putting these characters in these ridiculously terrifying, stressful situations. And yeah, there's an element of, the, of fantasy to it, right? Like, you know, if you think of the novel It, Pennywise the Clown, that's not something that, you know, Pennywise is, is fantasy. He is the fantasy element. But what the children and then eventually adults in the novel undergo are very, very real human emotions and human situations. And Stephen King uses that novel to kind of explore those emotions that the kids and then eventually adults are undergoing and how their child minds and then eventually adult minds are processing it. Um, and Pennywise is just kind of there as a symbol to help them work through all that, which makes Pennywise sound way more helpful than he actually is, but usually this is what you see in gothic literature and in horror. You see the fantasy element kind of serving as the, you know, physicalized monster of whatever mental turmoil your characters are going through. So it stands to reason that anytime we look at a piece of gothic literature, one of the first things that we want to ask is what is the human issue here? What is the problem, the human problem, that has nothing to do with the supernatural in this story? And that's with any of Poe's stories, you can find that. If you look at The Black Cat, like we're looking at this week, if you look at The Cask of Amontillado or The Fall of the House of Usher, even his poems, um, even The Raven, if you look at any of his work, there's always a human issue. By exploring these human issues, it allows Poe to arrive at an essential truth or at an essential understanding that tells him something about human nature. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little more when we go through the Black Cat. I don't want to say too much right now and give it all away or you won't even read the story, um, but we'll discuss that more further on. So Nathaniel Hawthorne, who we're not reading any of his stuff, we just flat don't have time, um, but Nathaniel Hawthorne, he wrote The Scarlet Letter, which you may be familiar with, like from high school or something, um, but he tended to look less at the mind and more at the heart, but he was still looking at the heart, in this case, under conditions of stress, under conditions of fear, mistrust, deceit, um, so he was still exploring very, very human issues. So Poe and Nathaniel Hawthorne were kind of known as the main gothic writers that started the trend in the U.S. Um, also a little bit Washington Irving, who wrote The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, um, but not quite as much as Poe and Hawthorne, actually. Eventually, American Gothic kind of transformed and a more of an emphasis was placed on Southern Gothic. So there, there, there's Gothic-type literature coming from all parts of the U.S., but Southern Gothic really kind of became its own unique sort of genre. Historically, part of the reason for this was that the Civil War happened, right? And people were, I mean, they were living in a nightmare already, um, both politically, socially, economically. And they, you know, they'd lost friends, they'd lost family. It was just bad. And they didn't want to read things that were also bad and things that were talking about, you know, human suffering and human mental issues. And they, they wanted release. They wanted a break. They wanted distraction. And usually you go to literature, back then, obviously, because there are no movies or anything like that, you would go to literature to escape. Well, they couldn't escape with gothic literature because it kept throwing things back in their face of how, you know, twisted sometimes humanity can be. So after the Civil War, they didn't really want to read any of that anymore, so gothic fiction naturally didn't sell as well. But during the 20th century, in the American South, it did start coming back. 
there are many authors that wrote Southern Gothic fiction around that time, but some of the more prominent ones would be Flannery O'Connor, William Faulkner, and they focused obviously on human issues, but they were also kind of characterized by this overall pessimistic outlook. So when we look at Southern Gothic literature, which probably next week we will, not this week, because this week is Poe, just American Gothic, but when we look, when we look at Southern Gothic, um, usually we'll see instances of mystery and eccentricity, so people, characters who are kind of larger than life, we call them big characters, not meaning that they're like big, but meaning that they are, you know, big of personality, so to speak. They have huge personalities, they're, they're eccentric, they're kind of quirky, they're weird cat is turning my camera. <laughs> also, Southern Gothic stories are rooted in, well, the South. In um, the geography of the South, you'll see some real towns mentioned and also some fake ones that they've just made up, but they sound 100% like a real town. Um, you'll also see the history of the South reflected in there. Um, and so Southern Gothic literature was a really good opportunity, actually, for many writers to explore um, race issues, to explore class issues, to write about the things that a lot of people just were not writing about at that time. Thank you guys for listening to this super brief discussion on Gothic literature and Southern Gothic literature. Um, we've only kind of scratched the surface, but unfortunately that's all we really have time to do is scratch the surface. Um, so this week, again, we're focusing on the black cat, um, looking at uh, some themes and some elements found in that story. And then next week, we'll take a little bit of a look at Southern Gothic literature. Thank you guys. Bye.